Shalom everyone, this is Onia, and I'm making this video because I wanted to explain to you guys what my YouTube channel is all about. So, this YouTube channel is called Dead Sea Scrolls Religion because it is based on the Dead Sea Scrolls as the foundation of our faith, of my faith specifically. So, to give a little background about my past, I was raised as a Protestant Christian and my family has a background of being Baptist, uh, but we were raised up in the Episcopal Church. And so for around the time when I was a young teenager, I started getting interested in studying the scriptures for myself. And I wanted to really live out my faith and just fully understand what the Bible says. And I wanted to prove the Bible true. So the more I studied, the more I was discovering and I was discovering things that I that were different from what I had been taught and eventually I came to realize that there are other books outside the Bible which the Bible itself says should be in the Bible for example the book of Jude in the New Testament explicitly says that the book of Enoch is divinely inspired prophecy which means the author of the letter of Jude considered the book of Enoch to be scripture. And if it's scripture, prophetic scripture, then why is it not in the Bible? So that started me on a quest because I knew that what the Bible says is of greater authority than what random people in the church say. If your pastor says something that goes against what the Bible says, I was taught to reject what the pastor says and to follow what the Bible says. Above all else, the Bible is supposed to be our authority, according to what we were taught as Christians. So I understood that the Bible surpasses any what any human has to say. Even if every human says it, if the Bible disagrees, then those people are wrong. That's what I had been taught. So based on that teaching, I understood that I had to reject what the church said, that only the books in the Bible are scripture. I knew that based on what the Bible says, there are other books outside the Bible. So that started me on a quest to discover what other books that exist should be part of the Bible. So for many years, I searched and searched for as many books outside the Bible that could be considered for possible inclusion in the Bible for believers. And this was as much for myself as it is for other people, because I wanted to share my knowledge with other people as well. So I wanted for myself to know what is the Bible, what should be in the Bible and what shouldn't be. And then I wanted other people to know so that they could know what God's word is. And so that started me down a path. And around this same time period, I was also questioning my my faith in terms of was I living the life of a good Christian? And I came to realize that I wasn't because I was struggling with sin. I had always been taught by the church that everyone sins, even if you're a sinner, and since we're all sinners, it doesn't take away from your salvation. As long as you have a heart for God and you accept Jesus into your heart, and you're sincere about your faith, and every time you sin, you if you feel regret for it and and apologize, then you are good to go. You will, you are saved. You will be saved. You are born again because you accepted accepted Jesus into your heart. I started doing research about this, um, as well as so the the context of this was when I started going to college, I began being convicted of what food I was eating because I was eating pizza, tacos, cheeseburgers, basically every meal, three meals a day, every meal, every day in the food court. My, I had, I had, uh, I only went one semester and it was a part of the, what I paid for was, um, for the food. Uh, and of course, actually my, my parents paid for it for me but so um the food plan allowed me to have all kinds of all kinds of food that 
by many people's standards would be considered unhealthy. I could also have soda whenever I wanted, those kind of things. After about two weeks or so, one to two weeks of eating this way, it suddenly dawned on me, wait a minute, I'm being a hypocrite because all this time when I had been debating with people online, I had been telling them that smoking is a sin, doing drugs is a sin, and being a drunkard and being a glutton are all sins. And the the explanation I gave those people to try to defend that those things are sins is that those things harm your health. They're, they are unhealthy. I realized I was being a hypocrite because I was eating unhealthy food and not thinking I was sinning in any way. So either I was wrong about these other things and those things are not sin, or I was in sin because I was eating unhealthy and I was also uh, guilty of what the gospel talks about where you point out the speck in someone else's eye and you're ignoring the, the log in your own eye. So that was me. I realized, wait a minute, how can I condemn others for doing unhealthy, unhealthy things when I'm doing unhealthy things and I'm not condemning myself? That was hypocrisy. So that really messed with me and caused me to be in great despair spiritually and emotionally. And I just was in great depression. I, I did not know what to do. I was asking for help, help. What is healthy to eat? I did not know what was healthy to eat. I was trying to figure out and no one could give me an answer that was that made sense. There was no guide. And then, based on the comments, someone said to me, the person uh, was a deacon in my family's church. He said, I assume that you're not talking about kosher. And when he said those words, it suddenly dawned on me that that was the answer I was looking for. This whole time I had been wondering, what does God want us to eat? What is healthy according to God? And the Bible itself tells us what's healthy this entire time. It was right under my nose. The Bible tells us. So I immediately dove into what the scriptures say about being healthy. And the Old Testament clearly lays out what is required for us to be healthy. So immediately I knew that those parts of the law of Moses we're still binding on Christians because the other alternative is that it's not a sin to be unhealthy. And I knew for a hundred percent fact that that is not true. I knew in my heart, my conscience told me that eating unhealthy or doing anything unhealthy is morally wrong, regardless of what the Bible has to say about it. So based on that conviction, I knew it had to be true and that it had to be required of all people. So the Law of Moses, which talks about all these rules for healthy living, those rules were still binding. Just as the rules in the Law of Moses of don't kill people, don't commit adultery, don't steal, those laws are all still binding. So if those laws are still binding, why aren't these other laws still binding, the health laws? There was no reason to dismiss the health laws as not binding on Christians. So I just went right in and accepted those, and I looked started looking for science to prove my position, as well as I tried to find scripture to back up that these laws are still required for Christians. And I have I have found those that evidence. And so for those Christians who are not convinced about the health laws of the Law of Moses being required for them, you can watch some of my other videos on where I give that evidence, where I show how Paul actually supports this and says that it is sin to partake of uncleanness. He actually says that in his letters. In a list of sins, he lists uncleanness. And what's uncleanness? Look at the Bible. What does the Bible define as uncleanness? It tells us in the Bible. Eating unclean food is uncleanness, and other things are uncleanness as well. So Paul, in the New Testament, tells us that these things are sin. He includes it in his list of sins multiple times in his letters. So... Based on what the Bible says there, that, that was clear confirmation. And then that, that when I was searching for evidence that to support from Scripture that the, the food laws are required and the cleanliness laws, the health laws, are still required for everybody, that led me to websites, Messianic websites, where they try to argue that other parts of the law are still required for us, such as the Sabbath, the holy days, the annual festivals. So I became convinced the Scriptures clearly say in the prophets and in the New Testament, 
that the holy times, the Sabbath, the festivals, were not done away with. They are still binding. There is clear evidence of this. So I basically, in the course of a few months, I went from Protestant Christian to Messianic Jew. And I started living my life as a Jew and trying to follow the laws of Moses in light of Christ's atoning work. So during that same time period, I was also trying to find which group I should be a part of, which religious group I should be a part of. And I kept finding that each group I would investigate had major problems with their teachings. So I couldn't join the, those groups. So Protestants were out. Catholics had some good things and had more books part of the Bible than the Protestants, but they had some major false teachings too. So I had to throw them out. Then I would consider maybe the Eastern Orthodox have the truth. But nope, they not close enough to the truth either. That led me to the Oriental Orthodox. And though the Oriental Orthodox is a very diverse group of, of Christians, tr Christian churches, but there's one church in particular that has stood out to me and has stuck with me this entire time, where I am convinced that that church is the true church. And that is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church has the biggest Bible of all the churches. They include all of God's word, as much as God's word, more than any other church. So we talked about how the Bible itself says the Book of Enoch is divinely inspired scripture. It's prophetic scripture. No church includes the Book of Enoch in their Bible except the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. That, for me, was one major, major thing that was in its favor. Secondly, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church abides much more by the Old Testament laws than any other church. They believe in the health laws are required. They believe in many of the festivals, although not all of them, uh, for Christians. They believe in the Sabbath is required for all Christians, they believe. Um, and they're pre they have a priesthood in their church which has law, the Levitical laws for the priests. They, they do almost all those same laws for their priests for, in the church. Um, so there were so many things. And they believe they have the Ark of the Covenant. They even do animal sacrifices, some of them. So, and, they, and they strongly believe in circumcision. So all these things as a church was striking confirmation that that church is the closest to the uh the faith that i was discovering then i came upon the dead sea scrolls and i started studying them i was studying them in the context of how manuscripts of the bible differ between each other in readings there's actually a lot of variance between different copies of the bible a lot of people are familiar with the new testament how there's different variants between the different copies of the new testament but many people don't realize how bad it is in the Old Testament. Many would say that the New Testament has way is corrupted way more than the Old Testament. But I would say, actually, the evidence is in the opposite direction. The New Testament is preserved very well compared to the Old Testament, which is preserved much less reliably. And it makes more sense because the Old Testament spans a much longer time period of its comp composition from and how long it's been being copied down by later people. The New Testament had a much shorter time period for it to have been corrupted. So a lot of people like to harp against the New Testament as corrupted and unreliable when the evidence shows that it's much more reliable and preserved much better than the Old Testament is. And I go into great detail on my channel to show the evidence of corruptions. So I approach the scriptures from textual criticism perspective, looking at the different manuscripts. So I was studying the Septuagint for the Old Testament and the Samaritan Pentateuch for the Torah, the, the five books, uh, the first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And there are some shocking differences in the manuscripts. But that also led me to discover that the Dead Sea Scrolls have many, many significant variants from any other version. And they sometimes support the Septuagint 
or the Samaritan. So the Dead Sea Scrolls was an essential resource to discover manuscript variants and which reading is better than others. So I began studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. And guess what? In the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Jews who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had copies of the Book of Enoch. And they clearly regarded the Book of Enoch as divinely inspired scripture in the Dead Sea Scroll community. There's significant evidence that they did. So uh, we have a group of Jews at that time who have these scrolls who accept the Book of Enoch as scripture. The Book of uh, Jubilees is accepted by the Dead Sea Scrolls community. And the Ethiopian Orthodox Church accepts the Book of Jubilees. So we have two books in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Enoch, the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Jubilees, which are accepted by no other church, but they are endorsed in the New Testament as Scripture. The New Testament endorses the Book of Jubilees as, as well as the Book of Enoch as Scripture. And the Dead Sea Scrolls includes them as Scripture. This is a striking connection between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And the more I studied the Dead Sea Scrolls community, which evidence points to, strong evidence points to those Jews being the Essenes, when you look at the Essenes based on the writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves, as well as what Josephus says about the Essenes, it becomes clear that, the, that Jesus, or Yeshua, the Messiah, he was an Essene. And his disciples, the apostles, were Essenes. And that the Christians of the first century were not a new religion, but was intended to be understood in the religion of the Jews. But which group of the Jews? The evidence clearly points to the Essenes being the foundation of the New Testament. There are so many striking similarities between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Essenes and the New Testament. It's unbelievable. The conclusion is undeniable. The apostles and Jesus were Essenes. They weren't just agreeing a little bit with the Essenes here and there. They were full-fledged Essenes. Jesus definitely, and his apostles, his disciples, I believe he took his disciples from different backgrounds. So not everyone was raised up in the Essene faith before they became disciples of Jesus. But once they became disciples of Jesus, they converted to Jesus' faith. They accepted the Essene ways as the truth, because they accepted Jesus as the truth, and Jesus taught the Essene way. So, in this channel, I show all the significant evidence that the Essenes are the true Jews, and that they are the foundation of the New Testament faith. And I show the striking connections between the Essene religion, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Which means, if we're going to be part of any group today, what group should we, be, should we be a part of? We should be a part of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. If there's any church we should be a part of, it's the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. They're the only group who has preserved the, the core scriptures of the Essenes, and who live according to the Essene way the most. They, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has a larger New Testament, and their New Testament commands observance of the Law of Moses for Christians, commands Sabbath observance, commands observance of the health laws, and it commands laws of excommunication that are almost identical to the laws of excommunication found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It also commands uh, communal living in the same way that the New Testament commands communal living, and the same way the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls commands communal living. It requires three years for conversion in the Ethiopian Orthodox New Testament, and the Dead Sea Scrolls also requires three-year conversion. The Essenes required three years conversion, and the Essenes did baptism for conversion into their faith. The same thing with Jesus. So, all these Essene doctrines and uh, and the Essene writings have clear counterparts in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So for me, that was enough to indicate the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is the true church, 
the only church that is close to the original faith. And that the uh, and the, the Dead Sea Scrolls are the foundation of our faith. So that started me on the quest to restore the faith of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And now, what should be in the Bible? This channel is all about what I believe should be part of the Bible as well. And um, based on my studies, I have discovered so many books that I believe should be part of the Bible that basically the general rule of thumb is if a book exists and could be uh, part of the Bible, then it is part of the Bible It for me. I assume by default that it should be included. Even if there's contradictions in the current copies, even if there's some doctrine that is very questionable, bordering on blasphemy, I will still generally include it because of the default position that those books were originally uh, true in what they said. So, based on that position that I take, I, by default, accept almost 300 books as part of the Bible. And uh, so this includes the, all the Old Testament, all the New Testament, basically every book that's in every church that is accepted as the Bible part of the Bible. Uh, and also, to give you an idea of the support for this concept, anyone who has studied these apocryphal books, there's a book called Second Esdras. And in it, it tells us that in the Babylonian exile, Ezra prayed to God to ask him to restore the law to the people. And so God gave him special power to restore the scriptures. So Ezra restored, well, according to Second Ezra, it was Ezra. He restored ninety-four books of scripture. Okay, so this was only in the Babylonian exile. That means um, any books of scripture written after the Babylonian exile or during the Babylonian exile are not included. So only the pre-Babylonian exile books are being included in this 94 number. So that means 94 books before the temple was destroyed, the first temple was destroyed, should be in the Bible. Then everything after also. So we're looking at, you know, New Testament alone is 27 books. And there's like, uh, we got... Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel uh, are all during the Babylonian exile, so they would not have been restored according to Second Ezra, because it was all books before the Babylonian exile that were being restored. You have books like Malachi, uh, um, Zechariah, Haggai, which were written later. So we're already, just by including a few of the other Old Testament books, oh, Book of Esther, Book of Ezra, Book of Nehemiah, so that already brings us to over 100 books of the Bible, and that's just the Old Testament. Then we go to the New Testament, 27 books. That right there, we already are over 125 books that should be part of the Bible. And then you start doing more and more research, and it becomes clear that there's at least as many books in the New Testament as there is in the Old Testament. So that means at least 100 books in the New Testament should be part of the Bible. So now we're looking at, at least 200 books should be part of the Bible. And so there's just so many other books out there that have so much wisdom and truth in them on the same level as what's in the Bible. People reject these books, but they have no clue what they even say. They don't even look at what they say. If they knew what these books said, they wouldn't be so quick to condemn them as false writings. So many of these books glorify Jesus as the Messiah and teach the church's teachings. So, like, how can the church reject these writings when they clearly align with the faith that they have? It doesn't make sense. They reject it out of bias, uh, based on tradition. And they don't believe it's possible that books could have been lost and, and rejected from the Bible. But the Bible clearly says that books can be lost and that the words of God can be corrupted. We are strictly commanded, do not add or take away from the words of Scripture, or you will be cursed. And 
this wouldn't be a warning to us unless it was possible. We're not, we can't be warned to do something. We wouldn't be warned to do something that's impossible to do. It doesn't make sense. God wouldn't tell us, don't flap your wings and fly to the moon because it's impossible for us to do that. So nothing that's impossible to do would God tell us we to do. Another thing that I focus on is the uh, New Testament clearly teaches and the Old Testament clearly teaches that we have to be sinless to be saved. This goes against traditional teaching of, of the church. Church mainly relies on what Paul says to support the idea that we can't be sinless. But the evidence is overwhelming that not only can we be sinless, but we must be sinless in order to be saved, in order to be born again. Now, this isn't easier said than done, but this is the requirement that Scripture teaches. And I show clear evidence of that in my videos on this YouTube channel. And the final thing to say here is my goal is to restore the Bible to the people. So I use textual criticism. Look at the different manuscripts of Scripture, Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, uh, the Samaritan Torah, and just the different versions that exist for each book that we know of. And I compare the differences. I, I will be sharing in my editions of the, of the books of the Bible, of the books of Scripture, the variance, the differences between each version, so that you can make your own decision about what you think the correct reading is. But I will also give you what I believe the original text said, the basic gist. I will be reconstructing the original text based on manuscript differences as well as internal evidence and external evidence and using history and linguistics to support those conclusions. My YouTube channel will also be focused on teaching history that is relevant to the Bible and language study, especially Hebrew and Greek, but may dabble in some uh, Latin, um, Aramaic, and uh, languages related such as uh, Akkadian, Sumerian are relevant for interesting study. Egyptian is relevant for interesting study. We wouldn't put, put as much focus on those languages just because they're not as important, but general observations from those languages are important for this YouTube channel. So all in all, this channel is all about the Bible and the books that I believe should be part of the Bible and the religion of that, that those books teach. And the religion that those books teach is the Essene religion, and the Ethiopian Orthodox religion. That is what these books point us to. So my YouTube channel will be all about showing the proof of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, showing the proof of the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and showing uh, the proof that we have to be sinless to be saved, and restoring the Bible in its full glory. That is my goal for this channel, and that is what I hope to share with you all, and discussing relevant uh, history, just giving everything you could possibly want to study the Bible properly and to come to the correct conclusions. We will be talking about philosophy and ethics in regards to what is sin, what is not sin, how do I live a righteous life according to God's requirements, Ph you know, philosophically evaluating who God is in different theological ideas, whether they're true or not. That is what this channel is all about. So I hope that you guys will stick with me and enjoy what my channel has to offer. I want to emphasize that although the Bible books are corrupted, they are not unreliable. A lot of people want to tell you that the Bible is corrupted and we can't trust it. So reject what the Bible says. No, that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the act, literal wording is not trustworthy, but the general concepts is tr are trustworthy. So um, the basic gist of what the Bible says in any book, I accept 100%. But the exact wording, I think, is open for debate and discussion. And, um, and the, the possibility that much of the words were removed and lost is open to discussion. But I am of the general position that nothing radical was added into most books of the Bible 
most books of scripture that adds someone's own idea that they wanted to put in. That I, that almost never happened. It happens so rarely that I don't think it's enough of a problem to to doubt the trustworthiness of the reliability of the scriptures. So many people you'll find on other YouTube channels who are going into these ideas, some of these ideas, they are leading people to reject the authority of the Bible. I know some people, some of my friends who I have debated with and discussed with, I've appeared on their channels before, and they actively go against the scriptures, some of them. They go against Paul. They say Paul was a false apostle. They go against books of the New Testament and say that the gospel, some of the gospels are uh, false, like the gospel of John is false. They'll say things like, we don't even know if the New Testament is reliable because how much time passed when those books were even written after the events happened. Um, I can tell you that I still stand by the faith that I was taught as a child growing up in the Protestant church, that the Bible is our authority. It is not the ultimate authority, mind you, but it is so much of an authority that we should trust what it says unless we have overwhelming proof that something in the Bible is wrong. So I would be characterized as a fundamentalist, probably, due to my belief that, that the Bible should be taken literally. We should follow what the Bible says literally and accept what it says, even the controversial things. There are so many things in the Bible that are extremely controversial, and the modern uh, Christians and modern people reject it as uh outdated ideas but no i follow the bible to a t whatever the bible says is the truth in the originals and so it is my goal to discover what did the originals say once we've discovered what the originals say then we should follow, accept what it says that is my position i do not go to the route of or oh, I want it to say this thing so it can support my modern ideas. I don't change the Bible to fit my modern ideas. I change my ideas to fit what the evidence says the Bible originally said. So by di diving into what the Bible originally said, we discover what the truth of God is. And that is what my goal is for this channel. So please don't think that I willy nilly put whatever I want in the Bible. I accept these books and their authority more than basically anyone else in this world. Every book, 300 books approximately, I accept as holy, divinely inspired Bible authority in the same way that Christians generally do of the 66 books of the, of the Old and New Testament. They basically believe it, that every book in the Bible is can, useful to establish truth and doctrine. We can come to correct truth and prove things are true based on the Bible alone, according to Christians, the 66 books. In the same exact way, I believe we can prove things are true and we can prove doctrines are true based on these 300 books of Scripture. I am one of the only ones who will treat virtually all these books on the same level of authority as the rest of the Bible. Almost anyone else you're going to go to will tell you. Yes, they accept some of these books of Scripture, but at a lower level. If those books contradict what the normal Bible says, then they go with what the normal Bible says. Not, not for me. For me, many of these other books outside the Bible hold an equal or greater level of authority than the books of the Bible themselves. Book of Jubilees, Book of Enoch, I hold a greater authority than basically the entire Bible. For me, Jubilees and Enoch are foundation to the Bible, and precede every book in the Bible with the possible exception of the book of Job. <clears throat> so, what it boils down to is uh, this faith you will not hear in virtually any other channel. This faith is these books are the Bible, and we must follow what they say, and we must trust what they say. Yes, there are some corruptions in them. 
But overall, we have evidence of what they originally said. Therefore, we just have to follow that trail of the evidence. And then when we come to the end result, whatever position we land on, whatever the evidence points to, that is what we must believe. So uh, that is what my YouTube channel is all about. Restoring God's word, all of it, and then accepting what it says and following it. And uh, strongly opposing those who disagree on this. Those who disagree and, and throw doubt into these books and think that these books are unreliable and untrustworthy, they, I believe, will not be saved because they are actively coming against God's truth. They are actively coming against the authority of, that God has established. God has established these books as holy authority for our lives. It's one thing if we are ignorant about these books and don't know about them and don't know what they say and don't know they are valid. Most people don't even know these books exist and what they even say. But for the people who are teaching others to reject these books, they will have to answer on Judgment Day for that. That is a grievous sin. People who are telling people to abandon Paul, people who are telling people to reject the Gospels as unreliable, people who are telling others that uh, Jesus is only a man, Yeshua is only a man, and he, he's not divine, these people will have to answer on Judgment Day for leading people astray. You can be righteous in most of your deeds, but if you lead people into wicked ideas and false doctrine, if you lead others to condemn the innocent, that alone is enough to condemn you on Judgment Day. We were told in the New Testament, we will be judged by every word that we say. Every idle word we say will be held against us, it tells us. And some people try to say, Paul is not our Messiah, so it's not required to accept Paul to be saved. It is true that you don't have to accept Paul to be saved. But it's also true that if you reject Paul, you will not be saved. The reason being is because we are told that we are accountable for, our, for how we judge others. How you judge, you will be judged. So if you falsely judge others, then you will be falsely judged. You will be judged according to that same standard. So uh, if you reject people for uh, who are innocent, you are coming against the, the righteous. So uh, the law of Moses speaks against false witnesses. And it says, if you falsely accuse someone, whatever punishment that they were supposed to get under the law of Moses, that punishment should be applied to you. So if you falsely accuse someone of a capital crime and you know that they did not do it, or you should have known they did not do it, but you wanted them to get in trouble, even though you had no evidence that they did it, you just don't like that person and you wanted them to get guilty for that, or you had a bias against them, then you should receive that same punishment. If you falsely claim that you were raped and you weren't, if you falsely claim that someone murdered someone and they and they didn't actually murder someone and someone else murdered them, if you, like, there's been people who uh, have framed someone for murder, for example. These things are of such a high crime against the innocent person that they require the death penalty to be applied to them. In the same way, False witness is forbidden as a sin. So if you condemn Paul as a false apostle and as leading people into sin and an unsaved believer, then or like a false prophet or things of that nature, and Paul actually was righteous and innocent, then you have disparaged an innocent man. You have been a false witness to a righteous person. And that will lead you into condemnation. It doesn't matter if it's Paul or any random Joe on the street. If you, let's say, let's say someone's grandma is innocent and you falsely accuse 
that grandma of something that she didn't do. You were a false witness against her, and you will not be saved because of the evil that you committed against that grandma. So it's not because Paul, is, I'm not elevating Paul and putting him on a pedestal, as many would try to say, saying you need to accept Paul to be saved. That would be uh, putting him on a pedestal. And again, I'm not saying you have to accept Paul to be saved. I'm saying you can't reject him. There's a difference. Because ignorance means you just don't know about it. Someone who doesn't know Paul even exists is not rejecting Paul. If they found out Paul exists, then they decide whether to accept him or reject him, or they could be on the fence about him. That's different. If you're on the fence, or you accept him, or you're not sure, whatever, you haven't rejected him. Or you don't know about him, you haven't rejected him. But if you find out about him, and then you reject him as evil, and tell others he's evil, that's a false witness, and you will be condemned, even if you're righteous in all your other ways. For if you fail at one point of the law, you are condemned, according to Scripture. And you, and you need to repent of those things to be saved. So if you don't repent of your false witness, you will not be saved. So uh, I take it very seriously. Anyone who rejects the, the Scriptures, including Paul, as true. Because if those Scriptures are true and authoritative over us, and we falsely reject them, then we are teaching falsehood and being false witnesses, and we will not be saved according to the judgment of the law and according to the New Testament, which requires us to ab abide by the law after we repent in order for us to be saved. So, all this said, that's what my channel is about. I really hope you stick with me uh, and enjoy this channel. Uh, so many things to come. There are some controversial things on this channel that I discuss. One of them, for example, one of the major things that a lot of people would find controversial is the connections with paganism and the Bible. I show evidence that a lot of what paganism teaches is actually true and supported by the Bible. And I show evidence for this. Now, a lot of people will be driven away by this. But again, what's more authoritative? What the Bible says or what we th think should be true? So the goal is to find out what the original part, text of the Bible said and then accept it. And based on that conclusion, what the original Bible text said was much more in line with paganism than people are comfortable with. So, uh, but my channel was all about teaching what the Bible originally said. And if the evidence points to something that was originally said that we don't like, I'm sorry, but I have to teach what the Bible says. I can't teach what the Bible has been changed to say in order to, to make it more friendly to people. I have to teach the truth based on what I have found. And so that's my goal. Even if you find something on this channel that you strongly disagree with, I, I implore you to not dismiss me, but to just wait it out. Be patient, because my version of the Bible will be so significant and very valuable for your studies. You don't have to agree with everything. I teach or believe to find value in what I have to share with you guys. Just my work on the Bible alone, the, the manuscript differences and the text of Scripture, just that alone is enough for you to find value from my channel. Even if you disagree with everything else, if you think the Essene religion is false, if you think Ethiopian Orthodox Church is stupid, if you are just a, a Protestant, traditional Protestant Christian, Still, my work on the Bible is significant because it will show you the variants of the Bible. And you can decide for yourself which variant is correct. My work will inform you of the evidence. And then I will allow you, the reader, to make an informed decision about which reading to accept and which not. That's on you, in your walk with God, to study what Scripture says and then wrestle with it and figure out what to believe. I can't make you guys believe anything, but what I can do is show you the evidence. Here's the manuscript variants. Here's what the different copies of the Bible say. And I leave it to you now to pick what the original text says. Here's what I think the original text was. Here's what the manuscripts say. Here's the translation that's literal, as best as I can provide you. Now that you have all this evidence, now you get to decide how do you interpret Scripture? How do you apply it? What do you think the Bible says? 
I give you the evidence, I give you my commentary, I give you everything, and then let you decide it for yourself. It's your faith, it's your walk. At the end of the day, if you become saved or not, if you become born again or not, it's on you. But I, my goal is to share knowledge with people, to share the truth with people, inform people of the evidence so that they could be saved by knowing what God's original words actually said rather than what man's perversion of those words are. I help people see through the darkness and look at the original light of what the scripture said and then allow them to make their own decisions. So that's this channel. Sorry for the long-winded discussion about these things, but I wanted to fully inform you guys about the purpose of my channel. So I hope this channel blesses you, and I will try to do more video content for you guys uh, very soon. So God bless you guys, and I hope you find God. I hope you become righteous, born again, and I hope to see you on Judgment Day on the side of God. Peace, everyone.